when we are talking about the communion, it, it was established, as you remember, on that night when Jesus gathered together his disciples right before his arrest, before his suffering, his death. And he was talking to them about certain things that were about to happen to him. That was typical Passover meal that they had. And he was doing that as typical Passover meal, but at certain point, he departs from the regular way how they were leading those Passover meals, and he goes into the establishing something new. Let us read uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, and we will read two verses here, 19 and 20. We'll spend more of our time uh, in, uh, in the book of Romans, but it will take uh, some time for us to get there. So let us start with the beginning, where it all began, where, where Jesus started or how Jesus established that. And we read the following. And he, meaning Jesus, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So this is a commandment that Jesus has. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you in the new covenant in my blood. So when we're talking about remembering Jesus' death and his suffering and his sacrifice, there are many different things that we could focus our attention on. Of course, uh, his personality. Of course, the weight of our sin. Of course, the righteousness of God. Of course, uh, the satisfactory nature of his sacrifice that Jesus had done everything to satisfy God's uh, righteousness. And many different things. We can, we can focus on the emotions that Jesus had at that night and the next day. We could uh, focus on disciples who were around him and many different other things which are useful and helpful and they can be a great blessing for us. But tonight I would like to focus on a central thing, on one thing which is kind of plays the, the more unifying role in that and look what Jesus is saying when he is introducing introducing the uh, the new way of remembering uh, instead of remembering the time when they were taken out of Egypt he is proclaiming new liberation and this liberation is focused or expressed in these two words the new covenant New covenant means the new type of relationship between God and, and man. You remember the old covenant, Sinaitic covenant when Moses uh, brought people out of Egypt and they had established or God had established the covenant between himself and the people of Israel and they agreed that they would obey and he would become their God and they will be uh, his um, people, his nation. And you remember they, they actually broke that covenant. They, could not, they were not able to keep that covenant. And uh, after a little while, after actually several hundreds of years, God is speaking through a prophet Jeremiah and he's saying, you know what, I am about to establish a new covenant. This is Jeremiah 31, 31. Not like the old one. That old one you broke because uh, I was faithful but you were not faithful. But the new covenant will be completely different covenant. And that covenant actually was introduced by Jesus first time when he was speaking to his disciples during this, uh, this supper, this Passover uh, supper that they were having together. So Jesus is introducing that. The thing that prophets were speaking about is about to happen. And it is related to my body and uh, being broken and my blood being spilled. So he is proclaiming the establishment of new type of relationship and I would like to talk about this relationship. 
Every time when we remember Jesus' death, every time when we remember the cross, we need to remember certain practical things that they would affect our lives. And this is what happened. This is what Jesus underlined when he was addressing his disciples. Uh, when we're talking about uh, New Covenant, New Covenant has an objective side and subjective side. Objective side is a promise, which, is the, which depend on God. And it's kind of independent of us. It's, it comes from God and it just sets up something in concrete and it will never be destroyed. But there is a subjective side of that covenant. Subjective is something that we feel. Subjective is something that we are coming into participation. And the subjective side of a new covenant is described in the best way in uh, the book of uh, Ezekiel. The book, book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. Jesus, uh, God is saying, and I will give you a new heart. So there is a new type of relationship, but this type of relationship is predicated or it's connected to a completely new nature that people are receiving because of that new covenant as a result of the new covenant. Actually, the problem of old covenant was exactly that their hearts were hardened. And now he is saying that I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So this is what Jesus is talking about when he is introducing this is new covenant. He's introducing that new type of relationship between God and, and man, and he is speaking about something that, that was about to happen with his disciples. So when we're talking about the Lord's Supper, Lord's Supper is a great testimony of something that happened to every believer. And that something mainly means that a person had been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and he had accepted Christ Jesus within himself or Jesus Christ accepted us within himself. Uh, this doctrine has a name or title. It's a huge doctrine. It's actually, uh, you can read volumes and volumes on that doctrine. It's called the doctrine of union with Christ. Reformers were writing, were writing about that, and we will touch today on some practical aspect of that doctrine, which is very important in our situation when we remember Jesus Christ who died for us. We'll focus on the union, the nature of the union with Christ, what it means for us, and then we will see how the union with Christ frees us from the guilt of sin and from the bondage of sin. These are two things that we celebrate tonight when we have our communion. So we just noted that Christianity is not an ideology. Some people think that it's a certain way of thinking. Yes, it's true, but it's not primarily an ideology. And it is not a culture. Yes, everything has its own culture. But Christianity is not a culture primarily. And Christianity even is not a religion. Yes, there is a religious aspect. So some aspect of worshiping God. Religion is a Latin for worship, worshiping. Yes, there is some aspect of that. But the Christianity, first and foremost, is the union of human soul with Christ Jesus. So true Christianity is the union of the soul with Jesus Christ. So if there is no that mystical union between the soul and Christ Jesus, there is no Christianity. This becomes as a result of a supernatural act or a miracle that God is doing and he is doing that miracle as a result or he, while he is reviving or uh, regenerating soul 
as a result of us being born again. So when we are being born again, this is a miracle, miracle which happens and human soul actually unites with Christ Jesus. Actually, Jesus Christ clearly was speaking about that many times that unless human soul will be quickened and regenerated by the Holy Spirit, uh, there is no way for salvation. A couple of passages just to demonstrate that. You remember the famous conversation between uh, Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of, of God. So it's, it's very clear. So it is not enough to confess. It is not enough to act. It is not enough to participate in religious activities. All of that is not enough. Unless one is born again, born of the Spirit. Unless the Spirit of God comes within that life and quickens that and changes that and makes it alive, a person will never be saved. He can act he can perform, he can behave, he can become part of the culture or movement, but unless that miracle happens in his or her heart, he's not a, uh, he's not a saved person. Uh, verse five, the same chapter. Jesus, um, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he eventually uh, repeats the same, just adds here water and spirit. Water obviously is uh, the word of God, it's just a metaphorical expression, and I don't have time to demonstrate that, but it's, it's true, we have a lot of expressions when the word of God is uh, connected with that idea. But it's very clear that spirit is using the word of God to quicken the soul, to enlighten the soul, to demonstrate the way of salvation, to show the truth of who the person is and who God is and what salvation is and what Jesus had done. And as a result of that word, spirit regenerates soul. This is described very clearly here. Apostle Paul is describing that process in different terms in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verse 13. Look how, how Paul is putting that idea together. And look what he is saying. He is saying, in him you also, in him meaning in Jesus. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Look what he, how he presents the salvation, how he pictures the salvation. He describes salvation that there's interaction of soul with the word of God, with the truth. There's interaction with the gospel, in particular, the, the, the central point of the word of God, the gospel. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit takes this soul and seals it within the Christ, Christ Jesus. In him, you also. It's not a, a free agent, a someone who is just flying around and being saved. No, there is no way of being saved without Jesus Christ. So the salvation happens, it is possible only in Christ, and this is what the Holy Spirit does. When someone is being saved, he is being placed by the Holy Spirit into Christ Jesus. And this is what, what the union with Christ means. Actually, there are many other passages that, that are talking about that. I will give you some more now. Uh, about 160 of those are in Pauline epistles. And other 40 we find in the Gospels and other epistles. So the New Testament is full of their, those ideas. Let me demonstrate a couple of Jesus' quotes, what Jesus himself was uh, talking, explaining that, that very important principle or truth. Uh, John 14, chapter 14, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, you remember that night that Jesus continues, that Jesus continues to speak about addressing his disciples about key things, and he's saying that I am about to leave you. But I will, let's read verse 16. 
John 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. And you probably heard a lot of explanation of this word, another. There are different words of another in Greek. There are words which are different. Like we have uh, one bottle here, and I have another bottle. Alex, uh, could you demonstrate that bottle? Yeah, this is my bottle. Another bottle. Yeah, you see, it's completely different. But we can say we have one tray here and another tray, which is exactly the same. So Greeks would use different word, alos here. For those heteros, different. But for the same, just another, they would use alos. So when he is saying, I would, he would give you another helper, helper, he's using this word, just like me. It's exactly the same. It's a different me. The one who is about to come, it's me, it's just the Holy Spirit. He will substitute me. He will come and, and work. And, and look what he is saying. To be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be where? In you. So he is speaking about this, that inner process which, we, which will happen or about to happen with disciples. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. And this is very interesting truth. When Jesus came to this earth, when he became full human, he was living on earth, but he was continually having divine nature within him. So God the Father was always in him. This is the essence of the Trinity, that inseparable union. Now look what he is saying to his disciples. Read it once again. He is saying, in that day when the Holy Spirit comes, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So he is actually describing our relationship with Jesus in the same terms as he related to his Father, in the terms of relationships within the Trinity, which is very important because this is inseparable, eternal, and complete union. This is what he explains here. But now let's see another passage when Jesus, this is what Jesus was saying to his disciples. But now let's read what Jesus was uh, saying to his father when he was praying in chapter 17. In the same gospel, chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So actually about us. That they may, may be all one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us. This is what the union in, with Christ means. This is what Jesus was praying to his Father. This is what he was asking. This is what he was about to introduce, to start. So salvation is not just accepting some ideas or learning some new behavior. No, no, no. To become part of new covenant means to be one, to become one with Christ Jesus in our soul in the very essence of who we are. We are not anymore defined by anything else but by Christ Jesus. This is what we see Jesus is talking. He continues on in verse 23. 
I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So Jesus is actually speaking about that more and more and more. Actually, the whole Christian life is built around this union. Let me demonstrate it really quickly to you before we will uh, we'll sing together just to rejoice, to thank God for this union. Couple of examples, or not couple, maybe five, maybe, maybe four. I don't know, <clears throat> I did not count them. But let's see, really quickly. Our redemption is in Christ. Look what uh, Paul is writing to Colossians 1, uh, verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into, into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. So there is no redemption outside of Christ. Redemption means that we are free from sin, from the guilt of sin. It's, it happens only in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are redeemed. If you are not in Christ, I am sorry. Then the next passage, the, uh, the, which demonstrates the same, Ephesians 1.17. Uh, Ephesians 1.7. In him, meaning in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. It's very clear. Then the ne next thing, our holiness is in Christ. When we are uh, talking about being holy, Ephesians 1.4, even as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. And when he uh, speaks about that, he speaks both about position, positional holiness, that we are justified, and actual progressive sanctification. It's in him. You know, take a person outside of Christ and try to sanctify him, and you will end up with legalism. There's no other way. So this is why people, they, they try to get on the way of sanctification and they end up with legalism and they just switch from legalism to antinomianism. Say, no, it's all uh, tied to legalism and we don't want to do anything with that. But Jesus is rejecting both. And he's saying there's only one way of salvation when a person is being sanctified because of that union with Christ. Our adoption is in Christ, so we all became children of God just because we had been placed in Christ, who is the Son of God. Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Fullness of life is in Christ. Look, Colossians 2, verses 6 through 9, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk how? In him. You know what? I would challenge you. As you continue to read your Bible after this sermon, try to underline and notice all those passages that speaks in him, in whom, in me. And we have, we have just myriad of, myriads of them. Hundreds of them, literally. This is what Christianity is all about. And he's explaining here, rooted and built up in him again, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to human traditions, according to elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The greatest danger is not where you will end up, in which kind of philosophy. No, the greatest danger that you will end up outside of Christ. That's the problem. This is what Paul is addressing here. And unfortunately, so many Christians, they are doing their religious stuff, and they're just missing out the main point that when you had been saved, if you are saved, when you had been saved, you had been placed in Christ, and that's not an accident. That's a design of God. That's the purpose of God. That's what, that's what he is doing. And our glory, and this is the last one, by the way, uh, our glory and perfection is in Christ. 
Actually, it's not the last one. There are many, many, many more. It's just the last one in my outline here. This is what we have, our glory and perfection, our Christ. So our future, our best, the best what we can expect is in Christ, not outside of Christ, not in career, not in marriage, not in children, not in politics, not in sports, not in beauty, not in anything in art. No, it's in Christ only. Look what, uh, what Paul is saying, Colossians 1, 27, 28. He is saying, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you know Christ, if Christ is in you, then you know that glory. You know taste of that. You will pursue that. You'll be driven by the desire to achieve that. This is why Paul is saying that I count all as rubbish in order to gain Christ because, because he understands that Christ is a glory. And now he, he continues on. Look what, what he's saying, that because of that glory of Christ, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete, how? In Christ. Over and over again, he speaks about that. So we can conclude this first portion, first part with the statement, with the conclusion that union with Christ is the essence of Christianity. It actually um, comes as a result of faith. It's, uh, it's a mystical union. It's something that is done in the spiritual world, but we can, can measure it. We can see that through, through the real faith, which, which is in the person, which is actually also a result of, of the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to the same uh, verse that we read, Ephesians 1.13. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise the Holy Spirit. So faith is the instrument by which the human soul is united with God in an indissoluble organic bond. So expression of this unity has two basic elements. Union with the death of Christ and union with the resurrection of Christ. So I will talk about union with the death of Christ today and Lord willing, we will come together on Sunday morning and we'll talk about the union in his resurrection, union with Christ in his resurrection. So let's start with the first one. The reality of, the de of death with Christ. So when we are talking about us dying with Christ, there is a certain idea that many, many people just cannot grasp or they avoid that. But we have, very, if you, we have, uh, we have several very clear statements in Scripture like this one. Galatians uh, 2, verses 19 and 20. For through the law I died to, to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. Look what he is saying. He is not saying I am being crucified with Christ or not I crucified with Christ, but he is saying I have been crucified. He is referring to a certain point in the past which something happened and was completed at that time. The, the perfect tense, or expression of something which had occurred in the past and had been completed at that time in the past. So Paul is saying about himself, he is saying that I had been crucified when Christ was crucified. How that happened? Actual salvation is the recognition that Jesus Christ, that in Jesus Christ, we died on the cross with him. Uh, the book of Romans helps us to understand that. Romans 5 verse 12 explains us how we all relate are related to Adam. 
Look what he is saying here. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, the death through, and death through, uh, through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. It's very interesting that all the people that live on earth were once in Adam. We are all born of the seed of Adam. That seed has passed through many generations. So, so the DNA of Adam, DNA of human, which was created by God, so that God created Adam and God created DNA. You know, DNA is the whole information that determines the development of, of uh, anything organic. So this is DNA. DNA determines, and DNA of a human is different from DNA of a dolphin or DNA of a monkey. So all people who are from Adam, they carry his DNA. And because of that DNA was damaged during the fall, all people who are born from Adam, they carry in themselves that sinfulness, which is revealed in several things like uh, self-centeredness or claim for independence from God or self-love and so on. So everyone, it doesn't matter where the human being had been born, I mean any nation, any part of the globe, you will have the same problem in every human being because they, those problems can be traced back to Adam. And this is exactly what Paul is writing here. He is saying here, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. We are all, we all sinned in Adam. We actually all had been in Adam when he sinned. He's our father in a very real sense, forefather. So now when, when Paul is explaining what happened with, uh, with us at the salvation, he is presenting Jesus Christ as a new Adam who is starting a new race. New generation of people are being born from Jesus. And they differ from other people, from people who, who had been born from Adam, because they have different spiritual DNA. Instead of self-love, they love God. Instead of spirit of rebellion against God, they have spirit of humility. That's the Christ's DNA. Christ was, you know, you remember what, what is written about him in Philippian, book of Philippians chapter 2. He was obedient even to the point of death. That's his characteristic. His characteristic, he loves God. He loves the word of God. He obeys him. He looks for that. He wants to obey God. He enjoys God. He, 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 he sees his future only in accordance with the will of God. So this is the distinctive of Christ's DNA. So the change of DNA, the replacement of DNA, um, I mean death of the old DNA and birth of the new DNA happened at the cross. That was the point where that change happened. And this is very, very interesting. You know, when Jesus took upon himself our sin, he took upon himself not just our sins, he took up or within himself us. You know, just as the righteousness of Christ is inseparable from him, you understand that there, you cannot take Christ's righteousness and separate from him. No, this is part of his nature. In the same way, our sinfulness is not separable from us. In order to free us from sin, Jesus actually had include us within himself. 
And this is what Paul meant when he says, I had been crucified with Christ in Christ. So everyone, all God's elect, all people who had been elect by God for salvation, predestined to salvation, who at any point will believe, all those people, people had been placed in Christ at the moment of his death and resurrection. And this doctrine has huge consequences. This is why Paul is saying, look what, what he is uh, once again, uh, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. This is why whenever Jesus is speaking about uh, real Christianity, real faith, he is describing that in a very radical terms. One example, Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Because there is no Christianity when a person continues to live for himself when he continues to live with that old Adamic DNA. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're not talking about that Christian when he is born again, he is free from presence of sin, but he is free for sure from the guilt of sin, and we will demonstrate it now, and from the slavery to sin. And this is exactly what we celebrate when we speak about Jesus dying for us at the cross. Apostle Paul presents this truth from another angle in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. The word concluded means that we came to a conclusion. We, we, dis, we decided, we analyzing everything that was available to us, we came to conclusion that this is true, that we all died. So salvation is inseparable from the conviction that I died with Christ on the cross of Calvary with the recognition of this reality. So we're talking about the union of Christ being expressed in our death, union in the death of Christ. And there are some practical expressions of that. These this are, you know, every doctrine we need to bring it to practical expression and especially these high doctrines. It's very easy to philosophize, to talk about just philosophical aspects of that, but we are going to find practical ways how it relates to us, to me, to you especially when we celebrate Lord's Supper. So Romans 6 is giving us a very good picture of what had happened. And if you would open your Bibles, because we'll spend some time in Romans 6, and this is a very, very, very interesting and very helpful portion of Scripture. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that, take, that grace may abound? So Paul is asking a question. He is anticipating a question. He just presented a picture that we are saved by grace through faith, and that's completely Lord's work. It is not dependent on any human efforts or activities or anything. We cannot contribute anything. And as a result of that, people ask the question, if this is true, does it mean that we can do whatever we want and just, just place our trust in the grace of God and more sin we do, more grace is needed. So our sinning machine is actually producing or prompting God just pouring more and more grace. Look how he explains it. He, he says, uh, verse 2, by no means. Uh, actually, old versions, uh, English versions, uh, would say it, may it never be. The Greek, in the Greek, is one of the, probably the highest negation possible in the Greek language. Megenoita. 
So he's saying it is absolutely impossible. And the reason why, he explains it. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Look what he's saying. He's saying that if you are united with Christ, you have died to sin back there. And then he explains, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? By the way, he is not saying here about water baptism. Yeah, water baptism is just an expression of spiritual reality. And spiritual reality is baptism, you can substitute this word with the word immersion. You had been immersed into Christ. The Greek word baptizo meant immersed something completely. So he is definitely playing with the, the, that idea, but he is expressing the inner, the spiritual reality. Yes, whatever happens here when we baptize people is just an expression of what had happened to this soul in spiritual realm. So in the spiritual realm, this person, at the moment of his or her belief, had been baptized, immersed, put into Christ Jesus. And he is actually underlining two things here. Uh, verse, um, verse 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who had been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So we are part of him dying at the cross. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from, the, raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So uh, in practice, our death with Christ is a deliverance from the guilt of sin and from the power of sin. And let me just demonstrate two things uh, really quickly before we turn to, we actually will sing once more and, and then. Then we'll turn to the communion. So deliverance from the guilt of sin in Christ's death. This is why it is important. It, is, it was necessary for us to be in Christ that we would be completely free from sin. Just, uh, God is absolutely just in every way. God cannot ignore sin. Or he never could go without punishing sin nor can he punish the innocent from sin. So because of that, God could not punish Christ for our sin. But in order to free us from sin and to be just, what God had done, he put us into Christ. And our sin has attracted God's wrath. And we had been punished with Christ. Actually, he bore that punishment. We did not feel that. But he bore our punishment that our sin has attracted from the Father. 2 Corinthians 5.21 explains that. Look what he is writing here. For our sake, he, meaning God, made him, meaning Christ, to be sin, who you know sin, that we in him, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So there was necessary that complete union of our soul with Christ Jesus, that we would receive that absolute freedom from our sin. So Christ became sinful in the eyes of God because, not because he sinned, but because he had united with us sinners. It's like, you know, somebody is just accepting some criminals and he is, he is accepting them into his house. He, he is covering them up and he is saying, no, no, I will take responsibility. It's probably not, not the best uh, illustration, but when, when probably you had seen those in, in history and literature where the father, he sees that his son had done some, something, and he's saying, no, no, I will pay. 
uh, he's my son. And he's not ashamed. Yes, this is shameful. And the father accepts the shame of his criminal son. And he is stepping down to his son and he's saying, I will bear responsibility for him. This is what Jesus had done for us. He has accepted us into his family. He's accepted us making us part of himself, him holy one. And he is saying, I am the holy one, but I will pay for all who are in me. This is what Jesus had done. Romans 3 describes that from the another angle, uh, verse 23, 25, and 20, uh, 24, and 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are, um, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it's not separately received redemption, but it's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. faith. This was to show God's righteousness. So in order to, for God to be righteous in every possible point, everywhere, so uh, God is doing that, he's, he's placing us into Christ and he is actually punishing his son for our guilt. So Jesus Christ died as a sinful man. He was righteous in himself, but by placing us within himself, Jesus took upon himself the fire of God's punishment, the fire of God's wrath, satisfying God's justice. And because of that, friends, we can be sure that all our sins are forgiven. When Jesus paid for my sin, all of my sins were future sins. We kind of easily can take that, yes, Jesus paid for my past sins. And Jesus paid for my present sins. But when we talk that Jesus paid for all my future sins, and it's not potential, it's actual payment. This is difficult to put it together in our mind. This is why the question arose, so now it doesn't matter how I behave? And Paul already answered that, that question, may, it, may it never be, it, it, it is impossible. Why it is impossible? Because when a person is united to Christ, he is a new creature. creation. He, he, will be, he will live in, in a different way. So when we are talking about this uh, uh, justification that happened. Let's go back uh, to the Colossians and Ephesians, uh, to those two passages that we already read. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. So it's, it's redemption not just being alongside of, of Christ, not just being, just know Christ, just, just we heard about Christ. No, we actually need to be in him because redemption, redemption is in him and forgiveness of sins. In Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So this is the central truth of uh, salvation. The forgiveness of sins is in Christ Jesus alone. And for those who are in him, the salvation of sin is, or forgiveness of sin is guaranteed by him. This is not just a possibility. It is accomplished. This is a fact that happened at the cross. And today as we partake the bread and wine, we affirm, we proclaim that we had been forgiven by Christ Jesus at the cross of Calvary. If you're in Christ Jesus, every your sin, past, present, or future, had been dealt with by Jesus Christ at the cross. Jesus Christ has accepted full punishment, making every person who is in him guiltless. It's not because of us, it's because of him. It's because of his sacrifice. 
is because of, actually, he is the only one who could do that. No human being could do that. Only fully God and fully man was capable of doing that. But there is a second side of that story, and that side is very important, and quite often people miss that. Let us read Romans 6, verses 6 through 7. So it speaks about us being delivered not just from the guilt of sin, but from the power of sin. And that happens in the same way because of the union with Christ in his death. Let us read verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Again, the same terminology. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. This is the meaning and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith in the gospel means acknowledging that by nature, because of our sinfulness, we deserve what Jesus Christ endured on the cross. Actually, that's because of our sin, God's justice poured out his wrath, his punishment upon Christ who covered us. At that point, this is what we deserve. And practically, that means that we acknowledge that Jesus Christ died on the cross and we died in him, with him. We died for our old self. We died for that old DNA. We died for old way of life. We died for all sinful, you know, the, those promptings that, that uh, actually describe or characterize the unbeliever, the person who lives by self, by self-worth, by uh, self-assertment, by self-elevation. So the apostle uh, says here, through the unity with Christ, our old sinful self died on the cross together with him. And to understand it, to believe in it, is to practically admit that our selfish life has, has been finished at the cross. So when you become a Christian, you recognize that your sinful self does not have right to live. It had been crucified with Christ long time ago. This is why Paul is writing in Galatians uh, 2.20. 2.20. He's saying, but as I live, I live for Christ. I live because of Christ's life, which is in me. So this is what he is, uh, he is describing here. So a little bit further in verse 11, he explains how it works practically. Look what he is saying. Verse 11. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin. You know, we are in Christ, we are free from the power of sin. Sin is no longer a slave master. We are no longer slave to sin. Christ Jesus has broken that bondage. Actually, we died with him, and you know, what, what, when, when a person owed to the bank some money, and he died. So what you will take from the dead person? Yeah, if he, if he had some property, maybe you can try to take, but if he had nothing and he died, and you can do nothing, he died. So our old self died, and sin who enslaved us, it just doesn't have you know, the, the way how to deal with that person. The old me died, and new me is enslaved by Christ. I have a new master now. My old self died. So this is the picture that Paul is describing here. So he's explaining here that in Christ Jesus, we are free from sin. And now what he's saying, you also must consider yourself 
dead to, uh, to sin. The word consider means count. Count yourself dead. And that's an important quality of a Christian. When we are thinking, when we are talking about spiritual growth, when we are talking about life, when we are talking about us living with the fullness of life of Christ that we have, the, this is the, the, the practical point how it works. If that happened, if once at some point you had been united with Christ and you had died with Christ and raised again with Christ uh, and had been resurrected with Christ, now what you need to do, you need to recognize that. You need to count yourself as dead to sin. This is what we celebrate every time when we have communion. Every time when we have communion, you know what, what we say? When I or you, when we take, uh, take the bread, and when you take a piece of bread and eat it, you demonstrate that as this piece of bread becomes part of you, that Christ Jesus is part of you and you are part of him. This is why it is very dangerous for those people who are not united with Christ to participate in the communion. Because it has spiritual consequences. It is dangerous for a person. But when we do that, we recognize, we proclaim, I have that union with Christ. And I had been forgiven for all my sins. And I have died to all my sins. This is why communion belongs only to those people who, are, who belong to Christ, who are united with Christ. It is this position in Jesus Christ that give us, gives us power to live a life of sanctification. If you want to be successful in your struggle with sin, recognize your union with Christ. Count yourself one with Christ. Count yourself dead to Christ, uh, the dead to sin and live uh, for Christ. This is part of our life. You must also consider yourself dead to Christ and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the meaning of the union of Christ. And I want to conclude, conclude this sermon with the word of Christ Jesus, which he said in uh, John 6, verses 56 and 57. Whoever, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Again, the same truth. And when we are talking, eating his blood and drink, drinking his blood and eating his flesh, it's not the physical, it's faith. This just demonstrates, these elements are just demonstrates this practical expression of what is happening. So we confess the gospel, we accept the gospel, we accept Christ every day through faith, by trusting him. And he's saying, abides in me and I in him. As the living father sent me and I live because of my father. So Jesus was living on earth because of his father being present in him. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the reality of Christian life that we celebrate and express through the uh, communion. And especially today, when we have this special day and special service, which we focus completely on the communion with Christ, union and communion with Christ. So uh, we'd have some time now, let us kneel down and spend just a couple of minutes thinking about our union with Christ. Think about the, the God has united you with Christ Jesus and just thank him for that. But my specific warning or specific word call would be to those people who are not sure that you are one with Christ. You know, if you are not in Christ, you are not saved. You need to understand that you continue going to hell, straight to the parish. So th this is what we need to clarify. There is not, no middle ground. There is no candidate, candidate to be saved, which would be reconsidered when, when Jesus comes. 
No, it's you're either in or out. To be in is simple. Trust in Christ. And even tonight. Tonight is the day. This is the time when you can trust in Christ. Trust your heart. And trust that you had died with him at that point that you would live for him and live not only here on earth, but live with him forever. Let us kneel down and spend some time in prayer. Our Lord God, we thank you for this greatest privilege that you had given to us. Lord, the beauty of salvation, the complexity, and at the same time, simplicity of salvation. It just goes beyond any imagination. What you had done sending your own son, the second person of the Trinity, sending down to earth that he became fully man, continued to be fully God, that he lived the perfect life here on earth and he came to the cross and at the cross he died and we died with him. And because of that, Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sin. It's just forgiveness. Just forgiveness because the price had been paid. The punishment had been carried out. And Christ Jesus bore it on our behalf. Lord, we cannot comprehend all of that fully. But we understand that this is a miracle that you had done for all those who believe or those who became part of Christ, part of the body of Christ, who became bride of Christ just because of the work of the Holy Spirit which at one point regenerated us and made us part of, part of the body of Christ, part of your nature. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this freedom today. It's not just freedom from guilt, but freedom from the slavery of sin, power of sin. And as we celebrate that freedom in you, Lord, I ask that you would bless everyone. You see every person, you see every heart, and you see what's going on, and you see the struggle. And you see those points where we win, because of you and those points where we, we still struggle and maybe lose. And our special prayer to, tonight, Lord, about those who are still outside of you, who still did not entrust their life into your hands, who did not experience that connecting work of the Holy Spirit that connects us to you in eternal union. Lord, do the miracle tonight and create new people in you and save those souls and help all of us to celebrate your death and resurrection tonight by confessing our union with you. In Christ Jesus we ask, amen.